Hello friends and gamers and welcome back to the fortress. My name is Jinx and today we're going to take another look at Napoleon in Europe. This is the second video in our Napoleon in Europe series where we do an in-depth review of the board game. The previous video was all about the miniatures, the board, the pieces, um, and the player aids and now we're actually diving into the rule set itself. The rules are divided into three stages. It's designed this way. It's going to be the basic rules, the standard, and the advanced. And so today we're taking a look at the basic rule set. This is Napoleon in Europe. What you see here is a historical scenario, 1796, the rise of Napoleon start. But in the basic rule set, you don't start this way. You get a certain amount of units as France and you place all the blue units in France. If you're playing Spain, you get yellow units and you place them within yellow territory. And that's basically it. In the basic rule set, you also don't have ships. Now these miniatures are from a board game called Victory 2 and you don't play with those. The base game comes up with these. But you don't play with these in the basic game either. In the basic game, all ships are represented simply by a dice roll. And so we'll get to that momentarily, but I thought I'd point it out before we get to the rules which are right here. Now the rules, my copy of the rules is very well loved and very well worn. There's a, you know, it's, it's seen somewhere. Uh, I wanted to flip through it. Napoleon in Europe, a game of strategic maneuver, political alliances and tactical battles. Introduction and there we go. The basic rule set. Now the basic rule set, they don't have too many pages to it. It's, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine faced pages. And the rest of it is just a tactical battle example. So that's fairly brief. And I don't want to mark this. So what I've actually done is I've printed off a copy where I could highlight a few things. So let's dive in. The game board. The game is divided into two, two types of things. Regions, which are land zones, and sea zones, water. Now, your pieces may not move in sea zones. All right. Next up, we have description of the map. So it talks about homeland regions. Homeland regions are colored in your colors. So these ones you see are Austria, they're colored in gray. The French are colored in blue, and those are called homeland regions. Now the stuff in between without a color outline, so Papal States, Venice, those are called minor nations. And they're owned by the last player to move into that territory. So if the French are the last player to move into the Papal States, they get a French roundel put in the Papal States before they move out. Now homeland territories, they act a little different. You have to have an infantry class unit present to have that effectively occupied. Um, you control it at that point. The second you leave your infantry unit out of there, it reverts back to the original owner. And that covers basically the game board. Ownership of regions, non-homeland, and homeland territories. Now it covers major nations. There's seven different types of major nations. It covers the colors of those nations. Here we are. And then it covers the pieces. Now in the pieces, it speaks about a few things. Now, infantry units, they get one movement on the strategic map, and they get one combat dice. All combat dice, they succeed on a roll of six. Now, um, a cavalry is next, and they get three combat dice, also succeeding out of six. And a artillery, it succeeds out of two if it's in the back rank, and out of four if it's in the rear rank. Battles are divided into two ranks on your side, and the enemy has two ranks as well. The general is equivalent to cavalry and gets three dice if it's in the front rank. And if it's in the rear rank, it could do something called rally. If it's rallying, that means it could bring eliminated units back on the board on a dice roll of five or six. Everything else just hits in fire phase on a roll of six. That's a basic version of how combat works, but we'll get into that in a moment. There's also a flag bear marker, and the flag bear marker, what that does, is simply just a task force marker. Nothing too special, it has no combat value. On the strategic map, everything moves a space of one. Unless you're a cavalry or leaders, then you move two spaces. How to win? There's two ways of winning this game, total victory or limited war. In total victory, it's a process of elimination. You try to wipe out all the other players. You know, you may play one nation or you may play three nations, but at the end of the day, you're trying to wipe everybody, the opposite player off the map. In a limited war, you play to a number of rounds, either 12 for a short game or 24 for a long game. Now, the way you count out victory points in this one is you, at the end of the game, at the end of the uh, pre-assigned length of time, 18 turns or whatever it is, you count up all the territories you have at the end of the game, and then you subtract all the territories you started with. So in the case of Austria, 
say uh, it conquers these territories as present here on the map. Then you count it up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You have nine territories and you subtract the ones you started with. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have two victory points left over. That's the way that works. It's basically how much your nation has expanded. That's the idea there. Now, if you play more than one nation, if you play Austria and Russia, you do the same thing. You count up all the, all the territory you control at the end of the game and you subtract how many you started with and then you divide by two just to make it equal. That will give you an average of how much the average of your nation has expanded. Setting up the game, there's three setups. There's one called Even Steven, one called Middle Powers, and one called Stop the French. So you decide this beforehand, of course. Even Steven is everybody gets the same starting pieces. Each player gets eight infantry, five cavalry, three artillery, and one leader per nation. Now, each player can play more than one nation if they want to, and the way you can choose is either just choose just by freely choosing what you want to do, or you can choose them by putting a certain amount of tokens into the game board and drawing them until there's none left. You could do it that way. So in the case of two players, you chuck three into a box top, you draw chits until there's none left, and the remaining nation is a neutral nation. That's the idea there. Of course, you have to make sure they don't flip over so you get a different colored. Now that's how even Stevens played. <clears throat> middle powers gets a little bit more complex because middle powers takes into account the map. Now on the map, not all nations are created equally. Austria has a lot of enemies surrounding it. It has the Ottomans here, France is not too far away, Prussia's up here, and then there's Russia over there. Whereas nations like Spain, they only have really one enemy that they have to face. And it's not, you know, it's only the French border that they have to watch. And the Ottomans, likewise, they have, they share a border with Russia over here, but then they have all these Balkan states that they can fight over. Britain probably has the biggest advantage. They have a bit of naval power as well, not represented by this, but the off-map dice roll. And <clears throat> it's a little bit hard to get to their territory, so they are made weaker. So that takes into account that the closer you are into the middle of the map, you have different levels of starting units. So for instance, Austria starts with 12 infantry, Great Britain starts with 6, so big disparity there. Spain starts with 7, Russia 8, Ottoman 7, and Prussia 10. France also starts with 10 because they are, you know, they do have a, they're not quite the middle, but they have a few around them. And that's the way that works. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as the other one. Next is stop the French. <clears throat> It's France against everyone. This one I think is the most historical and probably the most interesting one. One player controls France and is almost as, all, as powerful as all the other players combined. He, the French player starts with five infantry, two cavalry, one artillery, and one leader for each nation that starts the game against him. The every other nation starts with six infantry, three cavalry, two artillery, and one leader. So basically plus one for everything else except leader. And set up with international homeland borders. All non-French players start the game as allies, but do not have to remain allied in order to win. A player may break his allies to attack another anti-French player. He may even want to help the French player or ally with him in order to become the most powerful nation. Because you're still working for that same goal of total victory, of eliminating all the other players, regardless if they're allies or not, you have to eliminate them all in total war. Or if you're working to that limited war with a preset amount of turns, you still want to be the nation that has expanded the most, or the player that has expanded the most. So if you're playing the French, but you're fighting against the Austrians, at some point the Austrians might flip if Russia gets too powerful in order to get Russia back out of the picture, uh, reduce them in strength a little bit so that they can have a chance at getting more victory points. You'll see alliances shifting and moving in that way, which is quite fun, I think. I think that'd be quite enjoyable. So of course, this way, this one's more historical, but I think it's the way the game should be played. Ideally, we play with more players, and then the more players you have, the more potential alliances you have. If France is too powerful, then there's going to be a big coalition against them. But any nation that gets too powerful is likely going to have a coalition forming against it as well. I think that would be quite enjoyable. All right, next up, the turns and sequence of play. Who goes first? Well, that's determined by a dice roll. Now, the sequence of the play's turn is you move, and then you battle. And then you draw cards and then you produce. In my opinion, draw cards should happen last, but we'll get into that later. Now, moving, you move any and all of your pieces. Battles, you resolve all your battles. If you're a winner of a major battle, you draw a card. Once you draw a card, you draw one for every capital region and one for every 10 regions that you own. And when you produce, you cash in your cards and get pieces. So in the case of Austria, right now, Austria would own one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine territories, and you round that value down. So you get one card for that, then you get one card for every capital region you own. 
And uh, that's it. If you won any strategic battle, you would draw another card. And that's the way that looks. So you have three cards to play. Next up, well, that is the main highlight behind it, but let's go into it. Movement is simply this. Infantry and artillery pieces move one. Everything else can move two. So cavalry and leaders move two on the strategic map. Amphibious movement is a little bit more complicated, but since you don't have ships, it's equally simple. So each player may move from a region that has an anchor symbol, symbol to another region that has an anchor symbol. You could move four units per capital region you own. So every nation owns a capital region. Paris owns one. If Paris was to capture Madrid, another capital region, then it would get um, you know, eight units that could move from an anchor symbol to an anchor symbol. That's the idea there. Now, um, some nations like Russia, you see over there that they, ha they have two capital regions. Well, only Moscow counts. They only ha get one capital region. Otherwise, capital regions are represented by these round holes present on the map. Now, there's a few tricks behind it. Um, every time, if you're moving amphibious, if I'm moving this army here from Provence to, um, let's say, Andalusia, so I'm coming over here and I would roll a die for each unit that moves. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I would roll seven dice. I'm gonna roll this for fun. Every roll of one, oh, sorry, every roll, yeah, every roll of one would sink one of my troops. They get wiped out. Luckily, I didn't roll anything. Now, then they just simply show up here because it has an anchor symbol. Now, there'd be a battle that occurred if I was at war with these guys. So you would roll a dice only if you're going against a neutral nation or any minor state or against anybody you're at war with. The only time you wouldn't roll a dice is if you're going to your own territories or one of your allies' territories. Otherwise, you roll a dice each time. Now, you come in here and you attack, and the last feature that the rules have is that you, in the battle, in the upcoming battle, the defending units get a plus one to their defense. So they would defend at a five and a six instead of just a six. Your stuff attacking would still roll and still only hit at sixes. Now, Britain is a little bit special in this case because any attack on British homeland territory you would lose your troops on a one and a two, not just a one, uh, not just a one like any other nation. That represents that the British were a little bit stronger at this time period. Now, if you, uh, yeah, I believe that's it. I've covered all of that. Okay, excellent. So let's go back to the manual. And here we see here, allied nations. Now, what does it mean to be allied? It's simply a declaration just to say, hey, do you want to be allies? Yes, let's be allies. And that's it. Now, <laughs> there's nothing else, no card exchange or anything. Allied players may take their turns together, but you can't take two turns in a single round. Allied players may move their pieces into the same region without fighting a battle against each other. And you could also move amphibiously into their territory without rolling a dice roll. So that's quite nice. Diplomacy. So, although the basic game includes no formal diplomatic rules, players are encouraged to take time between turns to meet with each other and make agreements. In these meetings, they can agree to alliances, card trades, who gets which region or anything else that is not disallowed by the rules. That's a very broad statement. Anything else that is not disallowed by the rules. Does that mean that theoretically I could say, as France, I could say, Spain, I want your territory for these reasons. And Spain says, okay, all right, I'll hand over my territory to you. And, uh, you know, maybe I could convert this guy to be a blue character. Boom. Like, does that work? Um, that's a very broad statement. Can you exchange pieces, exchange colors? It's, it's, it's almost too broad where you don't know the limitations behind that. Um, minor nations as well, or minor states as well. You could say, Austria, I want your territory, and Austria hands it over to the blue, right, to the French. Does that work? I'm not even sure. It's a very broad thing. I'm sure it does work because it says anything else that is not disallowed by the rules. That seems to be the case. Now, of course, other players are working towards their own goals as well. So they're not going to willingly give you um, territory because that's taking away a victory point from them. So that's the idea there. Even though it says anything else is not disallowed, it might not always be advantageous to do anything else. <laughs> There's limits to what you want to do. Now, next up, neutral major nations. If there's a nation like, say, the Ottomans that aren't in play in the game, that it hasn't been chosen by the, the draw, let's say. So at that point, it just becomes like a minor nation. You take off all their pieces, it just becomes like an empty territory that you can walk into and capture. Cards. Cards are used in the basic rules to determine how many new pieces you get. Now, cards, you ignore... You ignore the top half. You only look at the picture for your own entertainment, but this symbol is where it's at. So this symbol means it's Spanish. That means it's yellow. Oh, sorry, yellow means Spanish, 
and it's a I, that means infantry, and that character is infantry as well. That's all you need to know about this. We'll go on into how you draw cards. When you win a major battle, that means if there is more than six units on each side, you draw a card. So you get one card. For each capital region you own, you get one card in the draw card phase. And then for every 10 regions, you draw a card. Now in this case, you see I have two infantry and one artillery. I can start cashing them in. That's the next phase after drawing cards. You cash them in in different combinations. Regiment, Brigade, Division, Corps. Now the way you do it is if you have two infantry cards, you get one infantry piece. Boom. And likewise with all the other ones. If you have three infantry cards of the same type of any color, you can <coughs> you can cash in and get an extra infantry. Hold on, just trying to find another infantry card. All right, maybe I won't be able to find it that easy. There we go. You can get an extra infantry piece. Next up, we have the four infantry cards. Well, with four infantry cards, you can get six infantry pieces, etc. Now, there's also another version, which is like a full house kind of thing. If you have a cavalry, if you have an infantry, if you have a leader, and if you have an artillery, boom, there we have it. So you get one of each. Now, there's actually a little bonus that you can also get. If they're in the color of the nation you're playing, you get that much extra. So if you have, if you're playing Spain, you get an extra cavalry, an extra infantry on top of your regular cavalry, infantry, leader, and artillery. That's the way that works. There's also a wild card in here, which is Napoleon, which could replace any one of these. You could replace this one, and I have four infantry cards, and you get your six infantry pieces. So it's worthwhile saving up your cards to cash them in and get those extra. You can also trade cards with other people. Now, when you trade cards, when you trade cards with other people, you may not show each other the value of their cards before or during the trade. The truth of a player's statements about what the card is he is trading will only be determined after the trade has occurred. So, if you're playing as <clears throat> if you're playing as one nation, say the Fran uh, the Austrians, and you want to trade with the French, the or hmm, if you're playing as Russia and you want to trade with Spain, well, and if you happen to have a lot of Spanish yellow cards in your hand, you might want to do that so you get that extra unit. So you'll be trading back and forth. There's also ways you could kind of mess them up as well. You could also give them a blank card. If you happen to have a couple blank cards in your hand, you could really mess them up and say, I'll give you two cards in exchange for your one. And you throw it at them and kind of bluff them. And maybe you get a good deal out of yours. Maybe he's being honest and you're being dishonest. And, and he gives you, you know, two cards, right? That might benefit you. That's the idea there. So I think that adds a really fun dynamic. And at the end of the day too, even if you receive blank cards, you're probably not going to tell anybody you receive blank cards so that later on you can change them and get them out of your hand to somebody else. These will be like dummy cards that just sit in your hand. Of course, I'm assuming you could probably cash them in for nothing. There's nothing you can get out of them. Yeah, you may place them back in the deck if you want to kind of get them out of everybody's hand. That way people can continuously be suspicious of you. And then you produce and you place your units on into your homeland territory. If your homeland territory is occupied, well, you can't place any units. Now, in my opinion, you should be able to produce before before you draw cards, in my opinion. I think that makes sense because here you have, you draw cards and then you're gonna strike deals with everybody. Be like, hey, you know, I got these cards in my hand. I just received them. Can I exchange them for your cards? And then you try to strike a deal and it takes time. It takes long to kind of plan out what combination you wanna do. If you need those units right away, if you're gonna save to get more cards in your hand in the next turn, or if you wanna to try to strike a deal with the Prussian, the British, and the French player that turn, it's gonna be a lot of yammering going on before you produce units. So in my opinion, it should be produce units with the cards you started the turn with, and then you draw cards. That way, that way it speeds up the nature of the game a little bit. That's just my two cents on what I would improve in this game to speed things up. Okay, now we get to the tactical battles. Now, let's quickly take a pause, and I wanna show you this. This is a, a player aid that comes with the basic rules. Here it tells you the combination of cards you get and what you get out of them, so that's quite handy. It also reminds you of the, if it's in your player color, that Napoleon is a wild card, and cards with no symbols have no value. Infantry, cavalry, artillery, leader. This is the symbols. Naval movement, it talks about here. Battle dice, one for infantry, three for cavalry, etc. And also a date tracker. Tactical battles. Whenever two enemy armies occupy the same region, a tactical battle occurs. If there's more than six pieces on both sides, not including leaders, it's a major battle. If there's less, then it's a skirmish. If you win a major battle, you get to draw a card. 
And now we go to setting up the battle. You grab your player aid and you place it between the two sides. And you set your stuff up in the front rank and the rear rank. In this example, the French are attacking, and after you're all set up, you know, unknowing what the other player does, you remove and see what's happened on their side. Sequence of battle. The defender moves, the defender fires, the defender rallies, and then the attacker moves, fires, and rallies. So in my opinion, let's pretend this is the rear rank. The defender could easily put one unit in the first rank and just see what the enemy does. They don't even need to care too much about you know, front and rear rank. They just basically put one unit there, open up the cardboard to see who does what, and then they can move all their stuff up forward. That's one of the flaws in the game. And then they can see, ah, you know, yes, he's put a lot of units there, now I'm gonna move forward. They should make an exception for the first round where there's no move on the first round. That's what I would say. So now it's the front rank again. Okay, so the defender moves forward or backward, he fires, and then the defender rallies. So in this case, there's no eliminated units, so his rally is pointless. Then we do firing phase. So like I said before, if you roll a six, you have succeeded in hitting your enemy. So in this case, you would roll a few dice for all your units on the board. You'd roll, and the amount of sixes is how many casualties you cause. In this case, you cause two casualties. They are eliminated, and then the attacker goes. The attacker decides to move stuff up or back. Then he decides to roll. Uh, then he rolls his dice and causes casualties on the opposite side. And again, two dice on that side. And then he does his rally with his leader. And he got one rally. And so he moves it into the rear rank. That's basically what it is. Very simple, very basic kind of maneuvers and, and attacks in combat. And pretty simple. Now, if somebody decides to retreat, <clears throat> you could retreat at any time. But it gives the opponent one chance to one more fire round for anything that could fire from the front and in the case of cannons the rear rank you just get one more round with that and then they successfully get away now where can you retreat to and the attacker would also do the same thing if he decides to retreat then the defender gets to fire with anything that's able to and moves away where to retreat to you could retreat to any region containing uh, you can't retreat to any region containing enemy armies a region from which any attacking armies enter the battle, and the attacking player must only retreat to adjacent regions from which his armies enter the battle. And you can't retreat amphibiously. Now, the reason they make those rules there too is you have to be able to retreat. If these French attacked here, they can't retreat further into enemy territory. They have to retreat up north or... Uh, well, they just have to retreat basically the, the direction they came from. The defender, though, he can retreat in any direction except a direction that's enemy controlled or from which an enemy army has come into. You can't say all these come in here and these retreat to Provence. That would be ludicrous. So we can't have that. And that takes care of the rulebook, guys. We've gone through all nine pages. Now it's just that battlefield example. And I'm going to go over that battlefield example, but you've learned everything you need to learn. And the battlefield example really will just sink it into your heads what all occurs. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But if you're taking checking me out at this point, then uh, thank you all for watching. The example of a tactical battle. So the French are attacking the British. They set up their units over here. The French decides to put his stuff like this and the British player decides to put everything in his front rank in hopes of overwhelming. Now, like I said before, if you pretend this is a front rank, he could just wait, put that up there, see what the enemy does and then decides to move his stuff forward. He could theoretically do that. Okay, turn one, the defender fires first. Now the defender rolls for all this stuff. One, 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 three, three, four, four, three. And out of all those rolls, he gets, what's that, four dice? Uh, he rolls five sixes, there we go, five sixes. And those five sixes, he can choose who to target, so he takes out these five and those go in the rear rank of the enemy. He almost wipes out the enemy. You know, if he had taken out one more, it would have forced these guys to retreat because they have no more units in the front rank, and then he could do a pursuit round and fire. So it was a worthwhile gamble to throw it all up there. Six units down. Now, the French turn. The French decides, oh, oh uh, <laughs> he moves his stuff forward. And there we go, mon ami, I was gonna say, oh, mon ami. And he moves his stuff up forward, and he rolls his dice, which he gets four hits. And the enemy takes out four. Uh, well, he can choose who to target. And in this case, he takes out all the high value units. There we have it. And then he gets to do his rally. And so he rallies a one and a three and rallies no pieces. There we have it. Now we go to the next page. And in the next page, we have round two. Now what happens? Well, the British fire. 
and they get no sixes. You know, it's one dice for each. It's unlikely they'd get a six. Then they decide to roll uh, to rally, of course. So, so the leader moves back. Boom. Then they fire, and then the leader rolls to rally. And he rallies. These are eliminated. He rallies one artillery up here. That's the way that works. And then the French turn. The French does not move any of his pieces. He's pretty confident with how he has here. He rolls two dice and gets a four and a three. Uh, rolls two dice. Why would he roll two dice? Oh, rolls 14 dice and rolls no sixes. There we have it. He rolls for rally and gets no rally. The British player moves his artillery to the front rank, and now he has four, five, six, seven, eight rolls, and he rolls eight dice and get one six, and he can choose now to get a cavalry, and so the cavalry goes in the rear rank. And uh, he rolls a four and a five and rallies one piece. So he rallies it into the rear rank. Next up, we have the French turn, and the French decide moves to move their artillery in the front rank. It's looking too risky here. He rolls and he rolls three successes, and so he goes one, two, three. The enemy only has two infantry left in the front rank. The French rolls a three and a one and cannot rally. We move on to the next page. <clears throat> the battles are really quick, aren't they? Okay, the British player moves his artillery to the front rank. Oops, wrong one. Front rank, rolls his dice and gets one six. In this case, he can target and targets that. He always can target, of course. And he takes out that piece. Rolls a two and a one and rallies no pieces. So those are the way it looks. The French decide to go for broke and moves the leader to the front rank. Uh, yeah, I guess he was in the rear rank, but he moves to the front rank. He rolls 14 dice and gets no sixes. And he can't rally because his stuff is in the front. front. Then it's the British fifth turn. The British move to the front rank as well. They're going to go for broke as well. They're going to go there and they're going to roll and they, nine dice, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and they get two sixes. And in that case, they can attack these two. So it's pretty risky. Now the French, they decide not to move, and in the fire phase, they roll seven dice, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and get two sixes. So they can go boom, boom, wiped out. And then lastly, we have our last round. The British decide to retreat, and with the remaining two units, and so they move, uh, they, they choose to retreat, and so now the enemy gets to roll one more round of combat, and in that, they roll three sixes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out of seven dice, they roll three sixes, on improbable odds and in that they wipe out these two and the enemy does not retreat and so that's how combat occurs so nothing too much else beyond that if they had survived that last round the British would have been able to retreat to the adjacent territory um, but no nope, they did not survive and so that's how battle occurs very devastating brutal and nothing else to it I wish there was some means I think battles are too gruesome too brutal because you only get one card for the victor so you have the chance of getting one cavalry you have a, later on you'll get one cavalry or perhaps two cavalry from this card it won't make up for your losses here so I think there should be a little bit more money flow into it perhaps there should be a little bit more units present on the board where not everything is completely wiped out and only some of them are wiped out I think that would honestly be a little bit better but that's the basic rules, and I'm not going to make up rules here. <laughs> okay, optional leader rule. When a leader piece is in the front rank, uh, this is optional, an additional attack die is added to every piece that can fire. So, infantry would roll two dice, artillery would roll five dice, and cavalry would roll four dice. More than one leader in the front rank has no additional effect. So that's one way of playing this. I think it makes, I, I like the concept of it, but I think it makes the leader too powerful in the front rank. I think people would just end up putting the leader in the front rank all the time. That's my two cents on the matter. And that's it for the basic rules. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.